Welcome to Victory Christian Center. You're about to hear from our senior pastor, Pastor Stefan Schlugel, as he brings a message on a Sunday service. Well, we have uh, for some time spoken about the fact that we live in the last days um, before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I dare say that we are in the last of the last days. We've been in the last days for some time, but we're getting closer and closer to return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that the need for believers to learn to depend on the Holy Spirit has never been greater. We're moving into difficult times. Uh, the Bible speaks about that in uh, um, Timothy chapter 4, that in the latter days, stressful times will come. There's various other passages in the Bible that speaks about that as we move into end times, there will be difficult days. And for us to depend on the Holy Spirit is now uh, more and more important. Uh, you know, there's also that whole area of deception that we see so blatantly all around us. And I do believe that uh, we must stay very close to the Word of God, specifically to the written Word of God, and very strongly depend on the Spirit of Truth, which is one of the names of the Holy Spirit, that we depend on the Spirit of Truth so we do not fall prey to clever lies and sophisticated schemes. Um, you know, lies, uh, you know, there's the same old lies that the devil dishes up, but he redresses them, and the lies today are very cleverly dressed up, and their schemes afoot uh, to, you know, that are very, very sophisticated, and as believers, we need to recognize them and stay away and not be affected by those schemes. So what I would like to do is I would like to read a passage of Scripture, or begin with a passage of Scripture from John's Gospel, chapter 14. Um, and um, <clears throat> I have uh, gone back to one of my old uh, physical Bibles. And when I say physical Bible, I mean, uh, you know, these days I work with digital Bibles. Uh, and I typically work out of, my, you know, out of my tablet. But I've gone back to one of my old physical Bibles and, uh, you know, with some of the markings that I've made in there. And I've gone into John's Gospel, chapter 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus teaches on the Holy Spirit. And I've gone to those underlined areas there, and I thought I would want to share some of those truths with you, uh, truths that uh, uh, God has revealed to uh, some of us years ago. For some of you, this will be a good reminder, but for others of you, you've never heard teaching along these lines, uh, and uh, even if you've heard teaching before, there's always fresh layers uh, of understanding that come into our lives. So I'm reading from John chapter 14, verse 15, and these are the words of Jesus, and in my old Bible, these are the, the, the letters are printed in red because when we have a red letter edition of the Bible, it means that all the words of Christ are printed in red. So here we go. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot recognize him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize. Uh, let me start again. The world does not receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will not see me, uh, but you will see me. Since I live you will also live. And when I'm raised to life again, you will know that I'm in my Father, and you're in me, and I am in you. Wow, wonderful words. Wonderful, wonderful words. You know, when Jesus spoke those words to his disciples, uh, and he's focusing on his 12, um, you know, Jesus has layers of people around him, uh, but those closest to him were the 12. Um, 12 apostles to, that became the 12 apostles. Um, at that point, Jesus had finished his earthly ministry, which had lasted some three to three and a half years. Um, in John chapter 12 and chapter 13, um, Jesus spoke to them about his departure. He said to them that he was going to be crucified. He, he told them something they didn't want to hear. Uh, they didn't fully understand everything that was going on. But he said to them that his time had come to return to the Father uh, and that he was going to be crucified. And then in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, he began to teach them about the Holy Spirit 
and the Holy Spirit's function in their lives and, of course, in our lives. Because the, you know, the function of the Holy Spirit in their lives is the same function uh, that we have available to us today. Bible scholars call this the upper room discourse. Uh, because by now, Jesus is sharing uh, his last supper uh, with his disciples and then began to teach them about the Holy Spirit. He knows he's not going to be with them much longer. Uh, in fact, it'll be uh, a couple of days at the most uh, before he's crucified. Three days after that, he was going to be raised from the dead. He was going to spend a bit more time with them, reinforce some of the things about the Holy Spirit, and then go to heaven. All right, and we see there that uh, uh, in John chapter 13, and I'm just going to lay a little bit of a foundation uh, so that we understand the context of where these words were spoken. In John chapter 13, Jesus sat down with his disciples and he shared the last supper with them. And when they finished supper, the Bible says that he took off his, uh, his outer clothing and he put a, a towel around himself and he began to wash their feet. Now, that's most uncommon uh, and most unusual uh, because uh, uh, foot washing was done by the lowest servant in the household. So when visitors came, dignitaries for that matter, the lowest servant would come and wash the visitors' feet. Um, And, you know, feet uh, meaning that in those days they didn't have paved uh, uh, roads and so forth. They had, you know, dusty dusty feet and so forth and dirty feet perhaps. uh, uh, But here Jesus... uh, takes that, that form of a lower servant and he begins to wash their feet. Um, Peter is uh, fussing against it a little bit. Uh, is it Peter or John? He says, oh, no, I, I don't want you to wash my feet. Uh, he says, I'll wash your feet. He says, no, he says, he says uh, let me wash your feet, Jesus says. And what I'm doing now, he says, I'm doing it as an example that you should do so to one another. Now, sometimes uh, in churches and in places that have foot washing ceremonies, Uh, To me, I don't believe that that means a great deal today in our culture today. But when somebody serves somebody else, that's exactly what Jesus tried to demonstrate. And in fact, the leadership style that Jesus tried to get across to these guys was servant leadership. And not to be dominant from the top down, which is what's exercised in the world. But in the church, we, we operate in servant leadership. We serve others and we lead by serving them. Um, and, and so that's in chapter 13. And then in chapter 14, Jesus now swings into teaching uh, about the Holy Spirit. Um, and as I said, that is teaching that he reinforces after his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And he reinforced again uh, to them. He says, listen, he says, do not depart from Jerusalem until you've been endued with power from on high. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. And so Jesus teaches them about the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16, and he reinforces it afterwards. Uh, And that's kind of the setting that we are reading from right now. It's also important to realize when Jesus says that that he was going to send another helper or another advocate, it's realizing that after this point, Jesus was their helper. If they had a problem, they would go to Jesus. Say, Jesus, we don't know what to do here. Can you help us? And he would help them. All right. Um, and they said, Lord, we've got, a, we've got an issue over here. We don't know what to do there. He'd tell him what to do. Um, and uh, now he's telling them that he's going away. And of course, they were thinking, oh, gosh, what's going to happen to us? And this is where he then picks up and he says, and I will ask the Father and he will send you another helper or another advocate. And that word another here, uh, you know, in the Greek language, uh, there are two words that are translated into the English word another. One of those words is the word alos. And alos means another one of the same kind. And that word alos is in contrast to the word uh, heteros. Uh, And heteros means another one of a different kind. So Jesus said, I'm going to send you another, an alos helper, another one of the same kind. And we're going to refer back to that uh, understanding in just a little while. Um, 
and uh, he says, I'm sending you another one of the same kind. Of the same kind as who? Well, of the same kind as Jesus. Jesus had been the helper. He's about to leave. He says, but don't worry. He says, I'm sending you another helper of the same kind who will be with you forever. I'm leaving you, he says, but this helper that's coming, he will be with you forever. All right, so that's kind of the understanding there. Uh, the word advocate, uh, and we are reading from the New Living Translation. Um, the word advocate comes from the Greek word parakletos. Um, and normally we don't spend a great deal of time in a Sunday service to deal with Greek words, but I feel to do so today because these are very basic understandings that every believer needs to grasp and understand. And sometimes, you know, we need to go back into the original language to get the deepest sense of what God wants to get across to us. The word parakletos uh, in the Greek means one who draws out, let me start again, one who draws alongside to help. Awesome. All right? One who draws alongside to help. Um, in fact, there is no English word that would fully describe the meaning of that Greek word Parakletos. That's why we use different words to get the sins across. You know, in the King James Version, uh, they use the word comforter. Jesus says, I will send you another comforter. Well, that only reveals a facet uh, of what the Holy Spirit really does in our lives. And the word comforter, in the days when the King James uh, translation was produced, uh, the word comforter today has a different meaning, so we're a little bit stuck there already. In the New King James Version, uh, it uses the word helper, uh, capital H, because again, this is reference to the Holy Spirit. And I quite like that because the word helper has more of a broader meaning than just the word comforter. In the Amplified Translation, it does what the Amplified does so well. It amplifies on the meaning of the word, and it gives us the terms counselor, helper, intercessor, and intercessor meaning one who stands in the gap, uh, an advocate, a strengthener, and a standby. All right? I don't know about you, but I need all of the above. I need a counselor all the time. I need a helper all the time. I need an advocate. And the advocate there, the meaning there is that when people went before a court, they were out of their depth. So they needed an advocate to go with them to help them work their way around and uh, even to kind of stand in the gap for them. And the court there is not necessarily a legal court, but it was also the king's court. When somebody, say a peasant, was uh, uh, able to come before the king in the king's court, the peasant was out of his depth. And he just didn't know what to do. He didn't know what the protocol was. He didn't know what to say. Was he supposed to walk? Was he, what was he supposed to do? Well, he says they will bring a parakletos alongside him who would teach him what to do and uh, kind of teach him the protocol. You know, each time when I have gone on a marae, I'm a little bit out of my depth, <laughs> okay? When I'm going on a marae to either do a wedding or a funeral or have some other opportunity to, to sort of um, to, to, to speak on a marae, they always assign to me somebody that understands the protocol and they say, this is what's going to happen when we walk in. This is what's going to happen. Then you'll be sitting there. And then when you get up, this is where you stand. And then when you speak, you know, just be aware of this and be aware of that. And... Uh, and of course, I put my foot in it a few times. Uh, you know, one time this, uh, this parakletos that they assigned to me, he had learned my name. Uh, and my name being a German name is difficult to pronounce uh, for most people. Well, he got it right. <laughs> he got it so right and I was impressed. And when I referred to him and to his name, I got his name wrong. And that was not very good, all right? And he let me know afterwards that I had not done as well as what he had done. But anyway, so that's the whole deal that you go into a setting where you're out of your depth. They would assign a parakletos to you who would be like an advocate that will help you to get around, to help you to know what to say and what not to say, when to speak and when not to speak, and one actually who would stand in the gap for you and speak on your behalf. All right, so counselor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and stand by. The message translation calls him a friend, capital F. 
a friend. But not so much with the meaning of a friend like we have today, you know. <laughs> uh, friends, uh, it's again, in some places, they call that person that was going to be assigned to, uh, to go before court with them was going to be a friend to them and help them out in that moment because friends are there to help us out. All right, and so that's kind of the meaning there. And when Jesus says, I will send you another helper of the same kind as me, but he will never leave you. I'm about to go, but this one will never leave you. Um, and uh, praise God for the Holy Spirit in our lives. Um, praise God that he's ever present he ever wants to be our counselor. He wants to fulfill all of these functions that we've tried to describe with our English terms. And we're still limited because it, he's all of that and more. All right. And uh, one of the things that happens is when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, we no longer have the sense of loneliness at any stage that we might have had before because we are never alone. All right. We are never alone. Now, sometimes we might cry for human company, but we have divine company. Uh, and he lives on the inside of us. Uh, amazing. Amazing. So Jesus, just to emphasize who he's speaking about in the very next phrase, he says, he is the Holy Spirit. This comforter, this advocate, this counselor, this standby, this parakletos, he is the Holy Spirit. Once again, prior to that, Jesus was their parakletos. He was the go-to person. But now he says, I'm leaving and this other one is coming, another one of the same kind as me, uh, and he is the Holy Spirit. And he says, he leads you into all truth. He leads you into all truth, not just some truth, but into all truth. Frank and I suggest to you that you and I, in fact, nobody can grasp any spiritual truth without the help of the Holy Spirit. All right. And uh, it would appear, uh, it would appear as though that uh, when Pastor Vanessa was ministering the gospel a couple of nights ago, that, that clearly the Holy Spirit was upon him. In fact, can somebody take a picture of me as well? I quite like that idea of having a halo on me as well. So there is a, uh, the Holy Spirit there in the life of the person that communicates the Word of God. And there's the Holy Spirit there in the recipient's to help them to understand and to grasp spiritual truth. Anyone wishing, and this is in your outline, anyone wishing to grasp deeper truths from the Word of God must develop a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. All right, so the need for us to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You know, we speak about a personal, personal relationship with, with God the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. We speak about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ himself, but we also speak about a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Very short, we'll touch on the Trinity, which is a riddle to many Christians. I'm hoping to make some of those uh, uh, understandings a bit clearer uh, in our lives here as part of our teaching. He is the Holy Spirit, uh, and if you and I want to go into a deeper level of understanding uh, in the Word of God, in spiritual truth, uh, you know the Bible speaks about different levels of spiritual truth. Paul described it as uh, in like eating natural food. You know, he speaks about uh, milk, the milk of the Word, then he speaks about the meat of the word, which is like, you know, solid. Uh, and then he speaks about the strong meat. So there is, if you like, three levels of spiritual truth uh, that are available for us to understand and to step into. Um, and sometimes people go no further than the milk of the word. Uh, and that's a bit sad because there are deeper levels. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, anyway, um, Let's not go there. Uh, let's not go there. Uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to dish up as much spiritual truth to you as I can. So at any level of your spiritual development, you should be able to get something out of it and help you to get to the next level. All right, so there we go. He is the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. All truth. Um, and uh, 
Jesus goes on to say, he says, the world cannot receive him. He says, but you will receive him. So he differentiates between the world and, and then he says, you. He's speaking to his disciples and he's speaking to you and me today. The world, the people who are unsaved, who are busy with their lives, you know, busy doing what they do. He says, but you, he says, uh, um, he says, he says, you will receive him. They cannot receive him because they, they don't see him and, and they don't, wouldn't recognize him if they saw him and they're not looking for him. All right. And when we as born again believers, we've experienced salvation when we seek the baptism with the Holy Spirit, we hear about it and we hopefully have somebody that can lead us into that. Uh, we are seeking the Holy Spirit and, and, and Jesus says we can receive the Holy Spirit into our lives. We have received Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and we can also receive the Holy Spirit is our helper. And these are typically two separate events, two separate experiences, and every believer should have both. Now, in our New Believers class and in our School of the Word 1, we drill down in, for, into further detail and bring understanding because every, many Christians who are not Spirit-filled will claim that they have the Holy Spirit in their lives, and, and they're quite right. They have the Holy Spirit, and uh, as I say, we teach the difference between those two and uh, hopefully help people to step into the, what the old-time Pentecostals used to call the second blessing. All right, the first blessing is salvation, having received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The second blessing is receiving the baptism with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. The world cannot receive him. So in other words, in other words, we must be born again before we can receive the Holy Spirit. And of course, to be born again means to receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, to confess Him as Lord of our lives, to surrender our life to Him. Um, and uh, while some of these uh, understandings are, you know, very simple and, 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 you know, most of you are like, well, we have no problem understanding that we're all, we're sort of ministering. We've got people joining us from online. We don't know what background people come from. We want to make it as understandable as what we can so that everybody can step into salvation and into the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So once again, we must be born again before we can receive uh, the Holy Spirit. You see, only a forgiven human spirit can and be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes and he, he, we receive Him and He moves into our lives, our body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. All right? But specifically, He lives in our human spirit. All right? And only a forgiven human spirit can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So you understand that. Jesus says, but you know him. Says they don't know him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Now that's a very interesting statement. He says, you know him, the Holy Spirit, because he lives with you now. And they were not aware of that. Okay. But later he says he will be in you. He's with you now and then he will be in you. Now, to use a silly example, when I sit down for dinner and I got food on my plate, I know this is a silly example, but it'll help to get the point across. When I sit down and I got dinner in front of me, dinner is with me. But after I've eaten it, dinner is in me. How do you know that there's a difference? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I know it was a silly example, but hopefully it helps to get the point across. Uh, and... Uh, Somebody said once, uh, he says, uh, you know, we should always give thanks, uh, you know, say grace before we eat. But if you forget to give thanks uh, that after you have eaten, just do Psalm 103. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. All right? So you say grace afterwards. Uh, <laughs> okay. So he says, you know him. He lives with you now, and he will be in you later. In order for us to understand what Jesus is talking about, we really need to have a bit of an understanding uh, of the triune nature of God. We call it the Trinity. You know, when we do our New Believers class, uh, I tell everybody, I say, by the way, guys, we are Trinitarians. 
That means we believe in the Trinity. We believe in one God uh, and three persons in the Godhead. One God, and then you got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but there's still only one God. But there are three distinct and separate persons. All right, so having that understanding will unlock what Jesus is trying to get across to them. All right. In fact, in verse 9, uh, a bit earlier on, Jesus um, said to them, he says, look, he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because Jesus was operating under the direction of the Father every moment and every step of the way. And Jesus said to his disciples, he said, look, he says, I'm going to heaven. I'm going back to my Father, and I'm preparing a mansion for you. And... Uh, John chapter 14, you know, many of you know the passage. It's a fantastic passage that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself. Jesus making reference to the second coming at that point. And then like Philip is there and Philip head is spinning out. He says, oh, you're going to the Father? He says, show us the Father. <laughs> show us the Father, Jesus. And Jesus says, Philip, have I been with you this long? And you say, show me the Father. I've been with you all the time. Because the Father lived in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me at this point say, like some of you are like, <laughs> you know, I, would, I would suggest that the Trinity is probably one of the more complex uh, 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 things to understand in the Word of God. But when you understand the Trinity, it will unlock a whole lot of other areas. All right, so, so see, one truth unlocks another truth, and then another truth unlocks another truth. And so we need to wrestle with some of these things in order to get to the deeper levels of spiritual truth. So Jesus says, Philip, have I been with you this long? And, and you say, show me the Father. He says, he says, I've been with you all this time. But, but, but yet Jesus was still the second member in the Trinity, and they're talking about the Father. But the Father is in Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm in the Father. All right. And in fact, in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Okay. I and the Father are one. Now, all three members of the Trinity are distinctly separate persons. There are three of them. Okay. Okay. And all three members of the Trinity are allos, meaning another of the same in nature and in character. In the nature of God and in the character of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the same. They're all kind. They're all loving. They're all patient. They're all Exercise long suffering towards us. All right, so you know, it's not like when you deal with one and with another, you get sort of different characters. They all, first and foremost, love. God is love. The Lord is gracious. Is it Psalm 145 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercies. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Who is he talking about? He's talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're all an allos of one another, another one of the same kind. Yet in function and in operation, they are heteros. They are different. They're another one of a different function. The God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they each have a different role and a different function. And it's different and distinct. But when it comes to unity, they are completely one. That's how you get three persons and one God. They're not like many people. When you get three people together somewhere, you end up with three opinions. <laughs> Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit are not like that. They defer to one another. They are so much on the same page when you, you know, try, when you look at them and try to sort of analyze them, it's sometimes almost like hard to separate, separate out the three distinct persons 
uh, when you look at them because they're so on the same page and they're so intertwined and they're so one. This is how, you know, in the Old Testament, when God speaks to Israel, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. One God. Um, and, uh, you know, we speak about uh, Christianity being a mono theistic religion, mono meaning one, as opposed to a pluralistic uh, religion where people got multiple gods and, you know, different religions got multiple gods and multiple deities. We only have one. Yet the Godhead is made up of three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, no, he says, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will not abandon you. Yes, I'm leaving, but you will not be abandoned. He says, I will come to you. Now, that's interesting. Uh, when Jesus says, I will come to you, he was at that point not speaking about the second coming. He was speaking about the day of Pentecost when Jesus came to the disciples there by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, today, Jesus Christ lives in the believer through the power of of the Holy Spirit. And as I say, when I first heard these truths and this concept, like my head spinning out, it's like, <laughs> how do you put all of that together? Um, all right. When Jesus died on the cross and uh, his body was buried, his spirit went to hell. After three days, he rose again. He had a bodily resurrection. He appeared to his disciples over a period of some 40 days and then he ascended up to heaven. He had a bodily resurrection and a bodily ascension to heaven. And the Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, that means that the Father is in heaven and Jesus is in heaven. Yet we say Jesus is among us. And the question is, if Jesus is in heaven, how is Jesus among us? Well, Jesus is among us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, Christ within you, the hope of glory. How is Christ in you and he's also in heaven? Seated at the right hand of the Father. Well, he's in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people have visions uh, of, you know, there being a gathering of believers. There's worship going on or whatever is going on at any given time. And somebody sees Jesus walking in amongst the aisles, walking up and down and walking around. And it is quite possible that Jesus is able to leave heaven and come to earth and to walk in amongst the people and a group and be in a meeting and so forth. But if he's there, when we say he's here, he's with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and if you don't fully get your head around that right now, don't worry about it. it in my mind, the Trinity, we receive it not in one hit, but it, 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 there's layer upon layer upon layer of revelation until you get a fairly a good uh, grasp on that truth. Jesus says to his disciples, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm right in their midst. And many times when we come together and we pray, we say, Lord, we are conscious of your presence because you promised us that two of us come together, or three, that you're right in our midst. But how is he there? He's there through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And in chapter 14 and in verse 25, he goes on to say, I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything that I have told you. So Jesus says, I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you because within hours, a couple of days, Jesus is gone. You know, they are going from the upper room where his disciples had prepared the Last Supper the Passover meal, actually, which became the Last Supper. They're going from there to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prays. And then, you know, the uh, guards of the high priest came and they captured him from there and took him away and put him through various trials, accused him of being guilty, and then they hung him on the cross and killed him. 
All right. So um, it says, I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. You know, Jesus taught his disciples for about three and a half years while he was physically present with them. And on the day of Pentecost, the Father sent the advocate, the Holy Spirit, as Jesus' representative. Now, the Holy Spirit is not here to, as it were, uh, do what he wants to do. He's here because none of them do what they want to do. They're all here for each other. But the Holy Spirit is in the earth today, and he's in your life as a born-again believer and in my life to be Jesus' representative. All right? Um, and uh, and uh, it goes on to say here that uh, he's there. He says to teach the church everything. He says, I'll, I says I, he will lead you into all. He, he, will, he will teach the, the church everything. And by the way, the, the Holy Spirit is the true teacher of the church. Sometimes we make references to people that are anointed to teach the Word of God, but ultimately the Holy Spirit is the true teacher uh, of the church. And he's there, he says, to remind the church of everything that Jesus had already told them. Jesus taught them many things, but at that stage, a lot of truth didn't register with them. They heard it, didn't fully grasp it. Um, and he says, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he says, he will, he, will, he will teach you all things and he will remind you of everything that I have said. Now, there is a facet, an understanding here. that Sometimes people overlook. So you might get, say, somebody saying, oh, gosh, you know, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for many years, but I can't seem to remember Scripture. You know, like people do memory verses. I just can't seem to put it together. Can I suggest to you that that's a function of the Holy Spirit? Somebody said to me once, they said, look, he says, I'm working in the legal field. He says, I'm working with one specific act uh, the parliament has passed many years ago, and I can virtually quote the whole act to you. He says, but I've been a Christian for many years, but I can't quote scripture to you. He says, I can't remember it. And what that really means is that there is a lacking in the relationship with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit reminds us of things. And not in a kind of a mechanical sort of a way, but he reminds us of the scripture that we need at the moment facing what we're facing at any given moment. Suddenly that scripture comes up that deals with that particular situation so we know exactly what to do. It's a function of the Holy Spirit. All right. Um, and uh, so let me encourage you if uh, somehow that description applies in your life and say, oh gosh, you know, uh, how do you remember scripture like that? It's not an intelligence issue. And it is not even so much a, a good memory issue. It's a function of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit helps us. He brings up. You see, provided we've read the whole Bible from cover to cover. And you know, sooner or later, every Christian needs to do that. Because if you haven't read it, and you haven't heard it, the Holy Spirit can't remind you of it. All right? So it's amazing. It's amazing how we sit in a situation and, and we discuss something with somebody and the Scripture comes up. Well, what's, what's that? It's the Holy Spirit right there helping. Oh, by the way, guys. The scripture, what you're discussing right now, here's the solution. Here is the word. Here is the answer to your problem. Or here is the, the method as to how God wants you to proceed. Because we don't live according to the world's philosophies. We live according to the philosophy of the word of God. So it's a function of the Holy Spirit. So truly, the Holy Spirit is not only the true teacher of the church, and all of us need a a, a, a deep relationship with him to go deeper into truth, but he's also the one that reminds us moment by moment because he's always there. He's always there. You see, when Jesus says, I'm teaching you these things while I'm with you, I'm going to be gone soon. In fact, we'll refer to that again later on if we have enough time. So Jesus was their helper while he was with them. But when he went out the door and they were by themselves, the helper wasn't there. But he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will not only be with you, 
but he will be in you. So as a spirit-filled believer, when I turn from this way to that way, the Holy Spirit has just turned from this way to that way. When I go over here, the Holy Spirit goes over here. So wherever the ho- I am, the Holy Spirit is, and that is the same for you. So the ability to call on the help and to draw on the Holy Spirit is there with us moment by moment, literally moment by moment. When Jesus was interacting with his disciples, sometimes he was interacting with the twelve, sometimes only with the three. We talk about the inner circle uh, amongst the twelve, which was three disciples, Peter, James, and John. While Jesus was with Peter, James, and John, the others were alone. They didn't have a helper with them at that specific point in time. But he says, when the helper comes, he will be with you forever. So let me encourage you, my friend, to learn more and more to draw on the help of the Holy Spirit moment by moment for daily living. Not just when we are praying, uh, but moment by moment. And just sometimes, even just quietly, you know, you're facing a situation, you're facing a problem. Say, help me, Holy Spirit. And guess what? He's right there. For some of you young people or, you know, not so young ones, you're studying, you're in some sort of exam situation. You know, oh gosh, I can't remember. Say, help me, Holy Spirit, and learn to rest on the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit's not going to make up for laziness if you haven't studied and, you know, like uh, you haven't even hardly bothered to read the material, you know, then, you know, like, uh, (laughs) but if you have made an effort, then he will be right there with you to help you, um, remind you of things that you have learned but I will send you the advocate, uh, John 15, 26. He says, the spirit of truth, he will come to you from the Father and he will testify all about me. There's another facet of truth. You know, Jesus comes at them with chunks of truth. He says, There's about five or six passages in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, and we're just picking those out. Uh, he says, I will send you the advocate the spirit of truth. Now, the Holy Spirit has different names or sometimes different descriptions given to him, like we call him the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God or the Spirit of truth or the Spirit of Christ. Christ's Spirit is all the same. uh, It's all different terms for the same person, the third member of the Trinity, namely the Holy Spirit. He's called the Spirit of truth. And here is the punchline friends the Holy Spirit always leads us in line with the truth of God's word always say always with me always Always. there is never an exception the Holy Spirit will never contradict or circumvent the word of God and I say that because sometimes people claim to be led by the Holy Spirit they claim to be um you know, spirit-filled, and they claim to have revelation from the Holy Spirit, and quote-unquote, the Holy Spirit has told them to do something that is directly contrary to what the Word of God says, which immediately tells them, say, no, you have not heard from the Holy Spirit. No, no, but I've had a vision. does not mean anything. If it's not in line with the Word of God, it's not the Holy Spirit. It will be a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. There are deceptive spirits, seducing spirits, Uh, Some of them even masquerading as the Holy Spirit or making out they're the Holy Spirit. But no, there's only one Holy Spirit. And if you're born again, Spirit-filled, He lives in you. And when He leads you, you see, the Holy Spirit is the author of the Word. When He leads us, He will lead us through the Word and always in line with the Word, never contrary to the Word. I just kind of emphasize that. You know, sometimes people... People will, it's like Brother Hagin used to say, you know, people say, middle of the road, friends, middle of the road. People either end up in, on one side of the road in a ditch or they end up on the other side of the road in a ditch. And somehow God wants us to walk in, in the Word and walk, walk by the Spirit um, and, and not to sort of do one or the other. You know, they used to say that people who only have the Word and not the Holy Spirit, people, you know, Word only, people dry up. And, and people only, only have the Holy Spirit, but no Word of God, people blow up. But when you have the Word and the Spirit together, you grow up. All right? 
The Holy Spirit can be likened like to a river. Jesus says there will be rivers of living water flowing forth from your innermost being. And he speaks about the well of salvation, which is another teaching reference to the Holy Spirit. But if you like, the Holy Spirit being like the river of living waters and the banks of the river is the Word of God. All right. So the Holy Spirit will stay within the, within the, the parameters of what the Word of God uh, describes because he is indeed the author of the book and will never contradict or never circumvent the Word of God. He says he will come to you from the Father. And of course on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2 verse 1, uh, on the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all gathered together uh, in one accord um, and the Holy Spirit came to them from the Father. There was a sound of, as of a rushing mighty wind coming from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And Jesus goes on to say, and he will testify all about me. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will testify all about me. It's been said that when the Holy Spirit comes, he always points to Jesus. He doesn't point to himself. He always points to Jesus. And down through the centuries and through the decades, there's been so little understanding on the Holy Spirit and his function and his person, because he always points to the Holy, to, to, to Jesus, and because there wasn't any teaching around, and it's not until, you know, uh, different people came along and, and began to teach about the Holy Spirit. There was Howard Carter uh, began to teach about the Holy Spirit back in 1910, 1920s, uh, began to teach on the Holy Spirit, and began to point out that the Holy Spirit wasn't an it. He was a he, a person, and then you get others, uh, you know, books that have been written, uh, one of them specifically called Good Morning Holy Spirit, which brings an understanding that you can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit and, and talk to Him uh, and so forth. So he says, but when He comes, He will testify all about me. Testify means speak well of, commend. The good news Bible says, He will speak about me. And here's the key, friends. The more the Holy Spirit moves, the more Jesus Christ is lifted up. And if you were to go into a meeting anywhere at any time and come away from there and say, wow, you know, the Holy Spirit was really moving today. Here is the, the acid test. Was Jesus Christ lifted up or was man lifted up? Because if men lifted up, the Holy Spirit didn't move all that much. It's all about pointing to Jesus Christ, giving Him all the glory, all the praise. The power is His. The glory is His. The kingdom belongs to Him. See, there's no, pride, no room for pride in our lives, but there's most, certainly no room for pride in this place where the Word of God is ministered, it's all about pointing people, not to self, but to point people to Jesus Christ. John 16, 7. In fact, Jesus says, it is best for you that I go away. You know, sometimes people say, oh, would it not have been good? If we had been around in the days of Galilee where Jesus walked around to be able to walk with him and see everything he did, well, wouldn't that be great? No, Jesus says it's greater today. It was good when he was with them, but he says it'll be better afterwards. It is best that I go away because if I don't go, the advocate won't come. But if I go away, I will send him to you. And as we've said before, you know, uh, pointing out that when Jesus was with them, he was with them. But when the Holy Spirit came, he lives in us. All right. He's on the inside of us. He's with us moment by moment. The omnipresence of God is so true when it comes to the Holy Spirit. He's everywhere at the same time, but he most certainly lives inside the born again, spirit filled believer. John 16 verse 8. I'm going to move quickly uh, and verse 8 through to verse 11, Jesus says, And when he comes, uh, he meaning the Holy Spirit, the helper, the advocate, he will convict the world of sin and of God's righteousness 
and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. The world meaning unsafe people. You know, when the Bible speaks about judgment, the ultimate sin that in the end people will be judged for and the sin that will send people to hell is, the, is to refuse to believe in Jesus Christ and to surrender to him. It's not all of this other stuff that people do because actually all of this other stuff that people do, the sin in their lives, it's already been paid for on the cross. Because Jesus didn't just die for the sins of the Christians. He died for the sins of the whole world. It's already, the sin problem has been dealt with. So all we have to do in our own personal lives is to deal with the rebellion problem and to surrender our life to Jesus Christ and make him the Lord and Savior of our lives. So that's why he says, he says, the world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father. You know, amazing, when Jesus went to heaven, the Bible teaches us that Jesus took some of his own blood to heaven. Now, don't tell me how physically, literally that took place, but he took his own blood to heaven. And he went into the heavenly temple, and he went into the Holy of Holies, and he went to the mercy seat inside the Holy of Holies. And he sprinkled his own blood on there so that mercy would be extended towards mankind and the people could get saved. Salvation is now available. Righteousness has been freely offered to every man, every woman, every child. From the times that Jesus rose from the dead and went to heaven to the time that he returns. We speak about the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. The day of salvation will close for, for what it is on the day when Jesus Christ returns back to this earth. So my friend, now is the time to get saved. Do not let re your own rebellion send you to hell. Because the world's sin, Jesus tells us, is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness, he says, because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. So can I say that the main function of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believer is to lead us and to empower us. It's the main function. There's other facets to it, but these two are the, the, the main summary. Um, but the Holy Spirit's main function in the life of unbelievers is to convict them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So the Holy Spirit function in your life and in mine as born-again believers, if you are indeed born again, and in the lives of people that are still spiritually lost, that function is different. And when we pray for another outpouring of the Spirit upon all flesh, on our cities, on our towns, and we're talking about pouring out His Spirit on, on the whole nation, we're really praying, say, God, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict lost people of sin. He will convict lost people of righteousness and he will co convict lost people of judgment. The judgment will come, all right? And the only way to escape judgment is to surrender our life to Jesus Christ and to become born again. Once we, have, we are born again, we've, we've passed from judgment to life, John tells us. We've passed. There's no more judgment for the believer, um, and of course, there's other facets to that. We speak about the judgment seat of Christ, which really is better called the reward seat of Christ, which we will cover at some point uh, uh, in the not too distant future, actually. Um, so John 16, uh, the last passage I want to uh, you know, encourage you with uh, today, verse 12, he says, there's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. See, Jesus had so many more things that he could have taught them, but he says, you couldn't handle it. You couldn't even handle what I've already given you. He says, but there is more. He says, uh, uh, but when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. All truth, there's an easy truth, more complex truth. Uh, he will guide you into the milk of the word, the meat of the word, the strong meat, all truth. He says, he will not speak on his own, but he will tell you, what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. 
and he will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. So the Holy Spirit is there in our lives to constantly give glory to Jesus. To constantly draw people not to self, but draw them to Jesus. Verse 14, he will bring me glory by telling you what he's received from me. Verse 15, all that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said, the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. All right. So again, just to break that down, and then we'll close very shortly. He says, he says when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Bible also speaks about a spirit of error. You know, but the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and he guides us into all truth. Friends, we don't end up in truth by ourselves. We don't stumble our way into it and we don't end up by accident. We only end up in there because the Holy Spirit has guided us into truth. You know, Funny, but sometimes we talk about somebody, you know, giving a testimony. They say, you know, I was a real rebel and lived a bad life. And, you know, but then I found the Lord. And we say, no, you didn't find the Lord. The Lord found you. All right. And then I figured it all out. No, you didn't figure it out. The Holy Spirit opened the eyes of your understanding. And then I got really clever and I began to understand spiritual truth. No, you didn't get clever. The Holy Spirit opened the eyes of your understanding. All right. It's, <laughs> it's not about self and how clever we are. And what we're discussing here is not an intelligence issue and it's not a, an academic exercise. Sometimes people think that are really good academically. I, I salute you for it, but your academic abilities don't necessarily help you a great deal when it comes to a relationship with the Holy Spirit and understanding spiritual truth. I could, you know, we could travel around the country. We could go from university to university. We could grab some of those lecturers there. Some of them are high-end academics. But their sin is they do not believe in Jesus Christ. They haven't got an ounce of spiritual truth in their lives. All right? So this is not an academic exercise. This is a spiritual exercise with the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says that... Uh, when Paul had his experience uh, on, on his road to, to Damascus, and then later on when, when uh, you know, Ananias, uh, Annas, uh, somebody was sent to him, one of the disciples was sent to him to pray for him to get him baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says there was like scales fell off of his eyes. It's almost like he had physical scales over his eyes that prevented him from seeing spiritual truth. And that fell off. And suddenly he came into the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And next minute, uh, I mean, he is like, uh, you know, from day to night, it's uh, night to day. It's like, I mean, I mean, one minute he's persecuting the church, next minute he's building the church. Uh, uh, just phenomenal. And the Holy Spirit that came into his life. Jesus appeared to him, um, and then the Holy Spirit came into his life. So we don't, don't end up in truth by ourselves or by accident. We're guided by the Holy Spirit into all truth. The Holy Spirit is actually the spirit of wisdom and revelation that the book of Ephesians chapter 1 speaks about. And he's the one that opens the eyes of our heart to see. And I usually say, and I usually pray when I pray for lost people, I say, Lord, give them eyes to see. And they're not physical eyes as much as they're spiritual eyes. Give them ears to hear and give them a heart to understand. I think that's a very valid prayer, and it really encapsulates what Paul was speaking about, one of Paul's prayer, which is listed in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 onwards, uh, that God will give unto them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, the eyes of their understanding being enlightened. He will tell you about the future, Jesus says. We'll close very shortly. The King James Version says, he will show you things to come. I quite like that rendering of it. Because when people say, well, he will tell me, uh, you know, about the future. People are saying, I'm not hearing anything. You see, when, when God speaks to us, it's mostly not audible. Um, and some people receive understanding from God. Some people hear, some people see, and some people know. 
Last week we spoke about the knower on the inside of us. So it's hearing, seeing, or knowing. And for some of you, one of those functions is more prominent than another. I like that rendering in the King James Version. It says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will show you things to come. And sometimes we get, you know, we can have visions and dreams where we, there's literal sort of uh, uh, pictures that are in front of us, but sometimes there's just facets in front of us. We are seeing things, we are seeing things, and we keep on seeing things. And sometimes I'm hearing things, and sometimes I'm hearing a person's name, or I'm hearing, uh, I'm hearing uh, about, you know, doing this, or traveling there, or doing that, and, that, and that's repeated, and that lets me know that the Holy Spirit wants me to do something about this uh, situation. So one of the functions of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to reveal future events to us. And there are events coming in the future that we should know about so we can prepare for it. You know, David yong Joe, the pastor of one of the largest churches in the world in Seoul, Korea, he said, the language of the Holy Spirit is visions and dreams. So if you're expecting to hear audibly, you're going to miss the point. Because God wants to show you things, not only just tell you things. All right? And of course, uh, just a couple of examples here, and we'll close with this. That In Acts chapter 20, verse 22, Paul is speaking to the elders in, uh, in Ephesus. And he's traveling to Jerusalem where he knew he was going to be captured. And he was going to be tried, and then he ended up appealing to Caesar, and that's how he ended up in Rome, was able to preach the gospel there and there. He says, the Holy Spirit testifies in every city that chains and tribulation awaited me, Paul said. How did that happen? Probably through prophecy. Probably through somebody speaking with a prophetic voice to say, Paul, uh, God is showing me something that you are en route to Jerusalem. and, And we are seeing that there will be tribulation there for you. And that there will be chains. You will be captured. You will be locked up. And of course, the elder said, well, Paul, don't go, don't go. He says, what do you mean to break my heart like this? He says, I'm ready to die for Jesus. That's where I need to go. And that's what I need to do. But it was the Holy Spirit who showed him future events. The Holy Spirit wants to warn us of future things in our lives. He wants to warn us of trouble that is up ahead so we can divert and move around it. The Holy Spirit is here to show every single one of us uh, about things to come. So my friend, uh, I encourage you, uh, if you're not born again, and I'm speaking also to the folk from our internet audience, if you're not born again and you have not surrendered Jesus, your life to Jesus Christ, do so today. Uh, very shortly I would like to pray. And if you have not received the baptism with the Holy Spirit, why don't you begin to seek the baptism and get filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, And if you are physically anywhere close by, come and see us. We're happy to help you and very well able to help you to get baptized with the Holy Spirit. And for those of you that already are baptized with the Holy Spirit, seek a closer relationship with Him. We'll need it in these last days. We will need to function in the Holy Spirit more than ever before. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.